Good morning, good afternoon, and perhaps good evening to participants all around the world. My name is Talia from IRIAS Communication Department. I will be your MC today. I wish you a warm welcome to IRIA and OECD co-hosted event, Dare to Start, Addressing Gender Gaps in Entrepreneurship in Asia. A few housekeeping items for today. Firstly, I would like to inform the audience that this webinar will be recorded. Secondly, we will be taking questions from the audience during the panel discussion. So please post your question in the Q&A box below. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to invite Mr. Toru Furuichi, Director General for Research and Policy Design Administration of IRIA. Mr. Furuichi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for introducing Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon to you all. Firstly, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to all of you to participate in the webinar on gender gaps and entrepreneurship in Asia. I also thank OECD Tokyo Center to co-organize this seminar. Since the first signing of the MOU with OECD in 2014, OECD and area continue to work together how to move way forward the robust economic development in ASEAN and East Asia. We have published the SME policy index in ASEAN in 2014 and 2018, and now preparing the latest version. These publications allow ASEAN member states to share the best practice, and of course, consider the analysis on the increase inclusiveness in the women entrepreneurship. Today, we will discuss mainly. Following to the activities, ELIA launched the ESI Knowledge Lab, which marks the beginning of an exciting exploration of innovation and the start of public systems where research, thought leadership, and blend together in evolving synergy. Today, it is one of the greatest steps to collaborate with OECD on that issue in the region. In this meeting, we invite wonderful speakers and moderators from various sectors and discuss how to boost the momentum of the women entrepreneurship in Asia from various perspectives, including the policy gaps, inclusiveness, and the importance of data collection to further promote this issue. I hope that this discussion will help raise the awareness of this issue and to ask all participants to actively join the discussion here today. Lastly, once again, I really appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Furuichi. I am now delighted to introduce our moderator Ms. Jui Chakraforty, Special Project Editor for Nikkei Asia. She will lead the panel discussion today. Ms. Chakraforty, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for that, Italia. And I should also say thank you for Luigi san because uh, I find too often, you know, we as women are talking amongst ourselves. Um, and so it's, it's you know, we, we, we need all of the men as well, not just as, as passive, you know, supportive bystanders, but as actually active allies. So thank you uh, for, for actually being part of organizing today's event and, and for speaking, Furuchi san. Um, and good afternoon to you all. I am really thrilled and honored uh, to be moderating today's session jointly hosted by AREA and OECD titled Dare to Start Addressing the Gender Gaps in Entrepreneurship in Asia. Uh, I'd like to start by saying actually how appropriate is this title, Dare to Start. Um, as someone who has founded and built a startup ground up myself and, and, and having gone through that journey, I can say firsthand that courage is the first step. 
right? Having no fear about the concept of what society labeled as failure. Just having the conviction to say, this is what I want to do. There is a need for this and I am the right person to do it. That takes a certain boldness. And as women, uh, we are socially programmed to come to that point of courage, that point of daring to start with far more difficulty than men. Add to that the challenges of defying social expectations, getting funding, being taken seriously uh, by clients. It's an uphill battle. And progress comes from innovation. So when you have a system that is shutting out basically half the eligible human population, i.e. women, from daring to start, as a species, as humanity, we are setting ourselves up for failure. So thank you to both AREA and the OECD for facilitating this very timely, very essential conversation today. And before I introduce the esteemed panelists, um, I would like to remind you, as Atalia said, that today's webinar is recorded and you are encouraged to ask questions using the Zoom uh, Q&A chat box that you will probably see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will pick up the questions um, at the end of our panel discussion. So with that said, um, today we will discuss the nuances, challenges, and solutions to the gender gap in entrepreneurship in Asia, with an eye, of course, on the rest of the world as well, um, with Naoko Kawaguchi, who is the acting head of the Tokyo Center of the OECD, Julia Aimone Marsan, who is the Director of Strategy and Partnerships at AREA, Natalie Ao, Senior Associate, Gender Platform at the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, and Kanye Soren Sun Subapal, Assistant to the President for Special Affairs at Chulalongkorn University. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start with you, Naoko. Um, you, as in the OECD, recently prepared a progress report of the adherence to the recommendations of the, the, the 38 uh, member countries and beyond. If you could give us some insight into the progress, what your findings were, uh, that would be great to, to set things off today. Thank you. Thank you and um, good afternoon. Thanks so much, Dewey, for um, the wonderful moderation and um, very pleased to be here. And first, let me thank Aria and his team for organizing this seminar today with the OECD Tokyo Center. And I want to re reiterate the fruitful cooperation um, uh, between, of course, uh, the media here, but then also um, AREA. And thanks, Chui, for your, your kind introduction again. Um, today's discussion is really timely and um, and because, well, uh, as you said, Chui, um, by uh, empowering women and uh, tapping into the untapped sources, um, we'd be able to um, expect more economic growth and in, in a way that is more sustainable and inclusive. So um, at the OECD, as you said, we monitor progress made by countries to close the gender gaps in employment, education, entrepreneurship, and public life using the OECD's gender recommendation from 2013 and 2015. And just last month, as you said, the OECD reported back um, on the latest progress. In fact, across the OECD countries, gender gaps in entrepreneurship have slightly narrowed. But women, of course, experience greater barriers than men to set up, maintain, um, and maintain their businesses um, as uh, we, we always used to, to have. Um, so just some key points from the progress report, um, uh, just to set the scene. Um, while self-employed women continue to be less likely to have employees than, of course, self-employed men, the gap has still closed in recent years. Um, between 2016 and 2020, this gender gap narrowed in 20 OECD countries and closed by about 2% overall. The gap narrowed in the, in, in the most in Latvia, 1.3 um, uh, percentage point, and Ireland, um, minus 1 percentage point over the last five years. Um, and um, again, uh, self-employed women are, are, are likely to face more barriers um, than men on a variety of reasons, 
Um, of course, notably differences in growth ambition for their businesses as well, which I hope that um, we may be able to tap into. Um, data from uh, the European Union already shows that self-employed women are slightly more likely than self-employed men to report a preference for working alone. Um, and uh, I think that more, moreover, women entrepreneurs are less likely to report an expectation for high level of growth. Um, and this is explained by several factors, um, including that women are less uh, are more likely to operate businesses in sectors that are less conductive to growth, like personal services, and less likely to use growth-oriented business strategies. Um, like women entrepreneurs are less likely to export, um, which is again another um, point we may be able to um, to tap into. So um, again, higher barriers than men um, for women um, for various reasons that I think that we'll be um, discussing. And of course, um, some considerations should be paid um, in terms of women's business owners um, experiencing huge impact um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many of them had to close down business. Um, of course, coming back to um, various uh, persisting barriers um, like access to finance, um, but all of the issues that we will be um, tapping into later. And I think, well, again, uh, gender equality and diversity is good for business and economy. And I just want to say that um, in the OECD, um, we just want to make sure that, um, uh, um, you know, to make the link between women's empowerment and economic growth because this can really be the only way that we can push our efforts further, like we are doing in the G20 um, on the Brisbane target. Um, and uh, also this is why data analysis and monitoring um, work is, uh, is all very essential. So that's just to set the scene. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Nako. That actually is, is, is quite in, insightful and uh... You know, it, it always occurs to me when we talk about progress uh, to remember where we are and how slow that progress still is. When you say things like 3% and 1%, and you know, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Um, and, but any progress is progress, and, and, and that's also important to be cognizant of. And, I, you know, speaking about barriers uh, for, for female entrepreneurs, um, I think there, you know, typically there is there's a huge amount of attention placed to sort of that that stage of, and you know in, in, in the cycle uh, and, and not enough oftentimes on actually building the pipeline uh, you know coming in at an earlier stage when women are much younger and and, 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 and and then sort of creating an ecosystem at that point to be conditioning and programming and, and offering the right resources both psychologically and logistically. So I'd like to take this to Connie Sorn. Um, Connie Sorn, what, what in your experience, which there seems to be a considerable amount of in the space, needs to be done um, or can be done um, to come sort of earlier into a woman's life before we see them, you know, actually trying to build these businesses and not, not only to, to help them do better at that stage, but to actually encourage more women to even get to that stage, uh, to feed that ecosystem of, of, of psychological conditioning and opportunity earlier on. Thank you. Uh, I think you're muted, Connie Soren. Thank you, G, and thank you, Naoko, first of all, for, for inviting Jolalongkorn University to, to join this interesting, interesting session. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I could answer your, your question directly, but uh, at Jolalongkorn University, actually back in 2018, uh, that time the, the president uh, proposed to the University Council to set up July Longkorn Innovation Hub to encourage lecturers and researchers to, uh, to believe that their research can be commercialized and can become an innovation to support an uh, entrepreneurial e ecosystem among lecturers and university researchers. And actually, we, we couldn't do this so much with flexibility until in 2019, the, the president uh, 
set up a CU enterprise under the University Holding Company Act, which are allowed by the Ministry of Science and Innovation and Technology. And that time we can bring in a lot of uh, female researchers who has done some spin-off and startup company. Actually, that time they, they don't have uh, much knowledge about this, but they were encouraged by, by some alumni who, who get connection with private sector and also organized a training program for them with some like sandbox starting funding for, for them to do a spin-off and commercialize their, their research. So they, they spend time to be incubated and to learn and to have a new mindset. We also received some funding from, from the Royal Academy of Innovation from UK and sent them to be trained uh, under the Leaders in Innovation Fellowship programs. So that, that time we got only like 15 to 16 startup team with uh, female entrepreneurs. Uh, at that time, I, I may not say they are entrepreneurs yet, but they are female researchers who, who dare to start. And last weekend, we just got a story from them to share with, with our participants at a program under the university funding called the University Holding Director Program. So they share their, their story become before they become more successful like today. I can share that they are from Baya Phyto Farm, which are from the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Science. They, they learn how to produce a protein plant-based vaccine. And it just passed the human trial process. It's not finished yet, but at least they have come so far far farther than they thought they, they should they should do because she is just like in her uh, mid thirties that time, and now she is early forties. She, she is one of the best practice for for the university. That's so really it, really promising. That is that. I mean that that right there is is the narrative of, of progress, and uh, you know that's that's really good to hear. Very heartening. Um, you know, one of the, the the common themes, you know, in what Nalco said and what you said, certainly, you know, Nalco talked about how women are, you know, less likely to report high levels of growth, and and you talked about how you know women need to be sort of prodded um, to know that their research can be commercialized. Um, it just, you know, it, it seems that we just, uh, we need more encouragement than, you know, than, than men, men do, you know, largely due to the way that we're programmed from a very early age. And so I'd like to take this now to Julia. Um, Julia, if you could please talk a little bit uh, about, you know, why it is particularly important to encourage more women uh, to, to, to come into the digital economy, to come in as entrepreneurs, uh, especially in sort of this post-pandemic era and or, or what is sort of becoming the new normal uh, of pandemic era and, 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 and how maybe, you know, how, how, how we can go about doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Joey. Uh, let me continue the conversation uh, uh, going deeper and following up to what uh, Naoko and also Kanyerson have said. First of all, I mean, over the last couple of years, uh, thanks to the general support of the Australian government, we have started investigating this issue, the issue of the participation of women in the digital economy in this region, in ASEAN. And, you know, the issue of entrepreneurship, uh, more in general, it's also an area where we are actually collaborating quite actively with UACD, in particular with the colleagues uh, from the UCD Center for Entrepreneurship. So I'm really glad to be here and participate in this conversation today. But why this is so important? It is so important because in ASEAN, we are talking about some of the fastest growing digital economies in the world. And this is a phenomenon that has been even accelerated during the pandemic. So as you said, Ju, I mean, uh, if we are leaving behind 50% of the population because they cannot equally benefit from the digital transformation as men, then we have a problem 
And we have even a bigger problem if we want to build uh, in the post-pandemic recovery, more inclusive digital economies or economies and societies more in general, as everybody's discussing nowadays. So again, this is a global issue, but it's an even more prominent issue for ASEAN because the digital economy is accelerating so fast. And because we are observing that the good jobs for the future those that are well paid uh, and you know will uh, uh, give access to better position are those connected to the digital economy so it's even more urgent and pressing to fill in this gap there is no easy solution uh, it's uh, it's i think it's a long education process um, and you said it uh, women typically face more barriers uh, that's because of many reasons, social norms, uh, but also lots of biases uh, uh, everywhere in every domain of our lives and societies. Many of these biases are unconscious. So this is something that, again, we really need to fix with uh, collective action. And you said it at the beginning, Julie, it's also really important to make sure that men are part of this conversation. This is an education process that uh, the entire society should go through men together with women, uh, starting from uh, very early ages. So uh, I think uh, the issue of skills and education is absolutely crucial to address this issue. Uh, and then, I mean, there are also very practical steps uh, that could be, in a sense, uh, uh, taken forward. Think about uh, recruitment processes, making sure that hiring panels uh, have a good representation of women, especially when we talk about position related to the digital economy, to make sure that uh, uh, you know, when you put more women in the room, uh, you know that already the percentage of uh, women that are hired goes up. And this, I mean, we keep saying it uh, relentlessly. Uh, there's a lot of evidence, lots of literature, also showing that uh, having a more diverse uh, group of decision maker uh, in different uh, stages of their career is actually very good for innovation. Typically, a diverse group of people, uh, including gender diversity, uh, in this type of diversity I'm mentioning, is very good to see perspective and problems um, uh, in different ways, multiple, multifaceted ways, and therefore is conducive to better decision making, better problem solving, uh, and more innovation. So there's also a benefit in terms of uh, business model, management, uh, and the way we find solutions to problems. Uh, so it's actually more than a social problem. It's also uh, a very good way to uh, advance uh, our societies. Uh, uh, then, I mean, I think my three minutes are probably uh, over, uh, but we, we did some research to try to understand uh, what was the situation in ASEAN. And what we could see is that uh, there are gaps uh, uh, like in other regions in the world, especially when it comes to STEM educations, therefore skills associated to the digital economy, uh, entrepreneurship opportunities in the digital economy, but also very much leadership position. And this is very important. I mean, what we keep saying is that uh, it is not enough to say that women need to compete and maybe survive in the digital economy. It's really important to make sure that uh, they can thrive and uh, access leadership position uh, because we want equal representation uh, uh, in different uh, uh, in the different job distributions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Julia. Th those were some very insightful and important points. Um, and you know, and, and the thing you said, you know, towards the end about leadership is also that's so true because even in industries where you do have a roughly 50-50. Uh, a blend of, of, of men to women uh, in the ranks, um, you actually don't see any uh, in the C-suites or in the boardrooms. You know, the, the, there are industries where that actually shouldn't be happening at all because they are industries that attract a lot of women. And we still see that actually coming into leadership seems to be sort of the final roadblock, even in those, in those spaces. Um, and you talked about bias, which I think is also something that we all need to be really cognizant of and, and working towards. I actually, uh, I moved here from the US and people might be really surprised to hear this, but there are so many schools across America where kids are complaining that the teachers, we're talking middle school, so very young students, um, teachers, math teachers just ignore the female students in class. So, you know, it, it starts so early on, but um, I just want to come back to, you know, you talked about um, the push into sort of entrepreneurship opportunities and 
um, and, and, and things like that. And also diverse workforce, like that is all such a holistic ecosystem. The more women that we have coming into creating their own businesses, I think that that will create sort of a more cognizance about that as well. And so for that, I thought we could maybe go to Natalie about funding, which is um, oftentimes really the big roadblock uh, for women who are who are trying to start something is just trying to raise money from honestly a largely male VC world um, still. So you work with, with hundreds of, of social investors and I'd be curious to hear about how you see the current state of, of finance for, for women entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jui, and uh, thank you to Aria and OECD for hosting this panel on such an important topic. I'm truly honored and delighted to join the wealth of experience and expertise on the panel today. Um, so I'm Natalie and I'm a senior associate at AVPN. Um, just a quick introduction, AVPN or the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network is Asia's largest network of funders and resource providers moving capital towards impact in Asia with over 600 member organizations covering 33 markets. So at the AVPN gender platform, we work with the more than two thirds of AVPN members who have declared gender as a priority. Um, this includes initiatives such as organizing events to convene gender lens investors and funders of women led enterprises, uh, hosting the Gender Lens Investing Fellowship, which was a three month program to train investors and fund managers, as well as uh, running our own philanthropic pooled funds, which support women's economic empowerment, maternal and child health, as well as STEM education for young women and girls. So Julie, thank you so much for posing the question about funding, um, a, a very important aspect of the topic today indeed. Um, and just to really uh, talk about gender lens investing, which uh, in our work is how we approach supporting uh, and advancing the growth of women-led enterprises. So uh, gender lens investing or gender smart investing, uh, when it really first started, was uh, focused on only investing in women entrepreneurs or products and services that benefit women and girls. Um, but in the last uh, three years or more have really broaden to also cover, uh, you know, women on investment committees, women as investors, because these are very important factors that uh, ultimately lead to uh, influencing the final financing that women entrepreneurs get. So um, just to set the scene a little, looking at the state of agenda lens investing um, globally, I'd like to share some data from Project SAGE, which is a, a series of reports led by the Wharton Social Impact Initiative in the United States. So Project SAGE has been uh, looking at a global scan of private equity and venture capital funds uh, since 2017. And their latest report was published uh, December last year, 2021. And uh, they have been, uh, there have been four of these reports in the series. So uh, looking at the funds, um, the positive thing is that uh, between 2017 and the end of 2021, there was a 250% uh, growth of funds around the world that have uh, identified themselves as using a gender lens investing approach. Um, so that's globally. But if we look at Asia, um, if we combine uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia um, of the uh, funds which were surveyed. Uh, these three regions, which, as you know, uh, combine to be a very, very large part of the world um, and over one third of global GDP, uh, they are only um, just over a quarter of uh, the global funds which are uh, investing with a gender lens. So uh, it is a relatively nascent uh, at a relatively nascent stage uh, compared to the rest of the world. But that is also why um, it's very exciting to be in this space in this region right now. Um, as Julia, you were saying, it's, uh, you know, um, these regions have really uh, experienced rapid economic growth even during the uh, pandemic. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there for female entrepreneurs as well. 
Um, and really looking at the trends of uh, gender lens investing and access to funding for women entrepreneurs, I would say uh, two things briefly, and we, we can talk more during the discussion uh, afterwards, but um, it's exciting uh, to see firstly, that more mainstream investors are moving into the space. So um, previously, uh, if you look at since 2017, most of the funders who are supporting women entrepreneurs are impact investors or uh, development financial institutions. <clears throat> who are really looking at development or gender equality as their main goal and uh, using investment as one of the tools to advance gender equality. However, uh, recently, very excitedly, and um, it's very encouraging to see that more mainstream investors um, who are uh, looking at financial returns as their main goal are entering the space and identifying as gender lens investors because uh, as now Cole, Kanye Son, and Julia have mentioned, they really see that investing in women entrepreneurs is not only the good thing to do, but also the smart thing to do uh, in the diversification and mitigation of risk. Uh, and secondly, um, another trend that's exciting to see is that uh, there have been new models of innovative finance, uh, which facilitate better access to financing for women entrepreneurs, which I'm happy to share later on as well. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for that, Natalie. Wow, there was a, <laughs> a lot of very good information <laughs> in there. And uh, yeah, funding sort of, you know, becomes to round it all out, just such an important part of it for, for a lot of journeys. It is the first step and, and oftentimes also the last step as they're sort of working to exit. Um, so, that, and, and, and the thing I found interesting about what you said is, 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 the, is the, the number of the growth and the number of companies that identify as, as wanting to sort of, you know, become more exclusive uh, in, in America versus Asia. Just for some perspective, um, this, you know, this number really shocked me and I, I don't know if it's as shocking to everybody else, but I was looking at the amount of venture capital raised in America, how much of the venture capital raised went to women and it was two percent that's where we are that's where we still are as you know as a society and i think in asia that number is actually a little bit higher but uh, you know but, but still a lot of work to be done um, this was all really important really insightful commentary from all of you thank you so much i'm hoping we can have a little bit of a conversation now based off of some very important things that that were said um, one of the things that's really swirling in my mind um, is, is really social conditioning and programming. And, uh, you know, if, if you think even of, of sort of raising money, uh, venture capitalists, they are, they expect very aggressive projections, like that's just what you're supposed to do on your plan, what you're supposed to show. Um, and, and as women, we, you know, we tend to, uh, we tend to in fact undersell ourselves, not even fully recognize our potential, forget overselling, um, you know, that's, that's one of the barriers. And there are so many others that people alluded to today. I was wondering if somebody could talk a little bit about social norms, how that plays into this, and how we can really make a dent in that space. If I, if I may, should we? Please. No, that's that's a great point, and I just wanted to um, just quickly um, touch on that issue. And I'm just also going back to what you said right at the beginning that you know women are socially programmed, and I think that also goes back to this um, issue of traditional social norms. And I think that's very that's um, very very um, well staggering, uh, especially in this region. And I just wanted to give some some um, thoughts maybe from the um, the work that the OECD is doing in its development center um, called Social Institutions and Gender Index. And when we, we measure um, discrimination against women and in social institutions across 180 countries. And, and what, what's, um, what we came up is that, um, well, actually um, by tackling the social norms, um, that can translate in an additional 3.3 um, points um, percentage point in annual um, GDP growth in the South East Asia region. And mm -hmm. well, knowing that, um, uh, and also just uh, showing to you that um, unpaid care work in the region is, is really um, 
is, is hugely um, uh, uh, under the, the shoulder of women and girls. And um, there is a huge sort of um, country um, uh, um, diversity in the region. So we can't really um, generalize this issue in the region, but I'm um, just let, letting you know that in, in 2018, for example, women spent in the region on average 3.8 times more um, uh, time than men did on unpaid care work and domestic work, including on raising children, um, you know, caring for sick parents and um, managing household tasks. Um, and uh, of course, there are there are national um, uh, diversity. And um, but then, you know, Cambodia is the the big. Uh, there is the biggest gender gap. Um, there is um, Cambodia has ten times. Uh, more for women to spend on unpaid care work. Why, why am I saying this? Because even with the network and sort of education and um, skills and, and all the things that are um, needed for the women to thrive in this entrepreneurial um, activities, um, if they are not um, given the time and also this, um, uh, the social norms that are sort of holding them back to, um, to get into this, this world and of course dare to start, um, then, I mean, uh, nothing could happen. And, and I also wanted to say that, you know, in, still in some countries, because of the social norms, um, there is this issue of, um, you know, uh, having uh, women having their own bank account or credit card. I think that that's also a huge issue um, that maybe, Natalie, um, you may be able to um, uh, have, have some further insights on. Um, and also, I, I just wanted to say that um, that also kind of loops back into the, the financial literacy issue. Um, uh, that also kind of go back to um, Hania Son's um, and points earlier, that um, it's, it's not just about um, having, uh, you know, thinking about having good education and, and, and program in, in the, um, uh, you know, by, by, by ourselves, but, um, but some countries are doing uh, greatly in terms of um, integrating financial literacy in their national curricula from early on, like primary school and secondary school. So um, that's, uh, and, and even some countries have independent program on entrepreneurial um, uh, work. So um, I think this, this also kind of goes back to what national governments can do um, in terms of having, um, in terms of equipment, equipping women and girls from early stage to think about and to, to have the skills when they want to start up their business to, to be able to uh, to be able to leverage that. Thank you for that, Naoko. Um, and it, it, it does all come down to education, doesn't it? Uh, whether it's financial literacy or education policy around um, you know, harder things, but even the softer things, how we're raising the next generation of both boys and girls. You know, you hear all of these horror stories in Silicon Valley when, when women go to raise money, the things they're asked uh, from very, you know, seemingly simplistic questions like, do you have a male co-founder? Um, mm -hmm. To wait, why aren't you smiling anymore? You know, I mean, it's a broad spectrum and everything in between. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I think sort of having that kind of an ecosystem earlier on that sort of helps people on both sides, men and women, you know, in a whole sort of gender spectrum, you know, overcome biases. I think it's, it's so important. Everyone today, I think on the panel has talked about, you know, how holistic this ecosystem has to be because everything is tied into, into everything else. I mean, paternity leave, right? For example, I mean, if you set the tone of equal caregiving early on, you know, that would have ripple effects throughout the ecosystem as well. So um, I, I, I did, you, you did allude to Natalie and I did want to come back to her a bit later to talk about probably new models of innovative finance, but uh, I wanted to go quickly to um, maybe uh, Julia or, or if anybody else wants to, to chime in to talk about you know what sort of what the pandemic has has taught us about the digital economy and and what kind of sort of how do we go about sort of skill building or upskilling you know for for women like what is needed and what is being done in that space I'm going to try to address your question, but continue the conversation that we started earlier uh, in relation to something that you have just said, Julie. Uh, we often cite the Silicon Valley because this is the region in the world where you know 
we have the maximum number of studies about you know uh, the dynamics of an, of an innovation ecosystem, VC, the VC industry, and so on and so forth. And as you say, a lot of literature is telling us that uh, biases are big over there too, and we can assume that the situation is not too different elsewhere. So you said that at the beginning, that just 2% uh, in the Silicon Valley, just 2% of women get VC funds. And certainly biases uh, and education Sorry have a- Sorry to interrupt. Um, just to clarify, uh, what, what I said, or at least what I meant was that not 2% of women, but that the of the total VC yeah, money, yeah. 2%, 2 of funds. Yeah. But you know, there are lots of studies, lots of literature uh, showing that uh, one of the reasons, again, you know, is uh, uh, unconscious biases. Uh, this is an industry that is male dominated. Uh, and whenever you put more women in the decision room, the percentage of uh, uh, entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs uh, getting funds goes up. And there are also other very interesting studies showing the level to which uh, you know, these biases uh, uh, have a big impact in the way we conduct our lives. Uh, managers, uh, male managers uh, or male VC funders uh, with daughters uh, rather than uh, uh, sons, uh, they, have a, they have a higher propensity to fund uh, female-led startups or give promotions to women because when they see them, they probably think about their family situation and they tend to have daughters, they are more inclined to give them an opportunity. So you see that sometimes uh, uh, there are very, very, I, I can say random uh, uh, incidents uh, that could really change uh, the career of women. And again, by making sure that uh, there is more equal representation in the room uh, where the decision maker are, uh, that won't solve all the problems immediately, but certainly uh, can help. Uh, you ask me about skills. Uh, well, what did we learn? First of all, we learned that uh, now uh, the transition towards digital economies is, is happening uh, even faster that, than we were thinking uh, pre-pandemic. The pandemic has also revealed and opened up uh, uh, you know, a lot of different needs that now societies have. I mean, uh, during lockdowns uh, and in times of restrictions, we had to organize our lives and our work activities completely differently. That basically meant that we had to innovate. So I think nobody wanted the pandemic. It was a, a catastrophe for the entire world, but nevertheless, everywhere in the world, the pandemic was a catalyzer for innovation, transition to digital and also entrepreneurship. Because a lot of people, they saw potential business opportunity to serve these different needs that suddenly a lot of people in many different places uh, uh, were having. And this is why, again, I go to the point I was making in the beginning, it's really important that uh, not only men, not only boys uh, are taking advantage of this uh, push towards entrepreneurship, but more women uh, are including in the group uh, taking advantage of that. We are not gonna fix it tomorrow. I mean, it's something that uh, we have been talking for uh, decades. It's an education process, as you have already said, but I think it's really, really important to discuss about this issue of unconscious biases, barriers and obstacles so that uh, many people are increasingly aware of the difficulties and barriers that women are facing. When I, when I, when sometimes when I have conversation uh, uh, with colleagues or experts, sometimes they still ask me, yeah, sure, but why do we need to give uh, more uh, uh, why, do we, why do, do we need to dedicate more efforts to support women entrepreneurs? At the end, an entrepreneur isn't an entrepreneur. You know, a, a male entrepreneur or a women entrepreneur, they have the same opportunities. And they still need to explain that this, this is not so true, even if now, of course, women around the world have more access to education. Uh, as Naoko was saying, social norms are still very predominant. I think in every society around the world, I mean, uh, uh, in developed and developing countries, so it's really, really important to make the point because uh, sometimes not everybody yet is fully aware and fully convinced of the need of this kind of uh, uh, support measures. And I, just to conclude, and I think it's really, really important, we said it already, but it's very important to start from the early years. When we talk about, I don't know, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, you mentioned, someone mentioned, you know, about the fact that, uh, 
um, mathematics teachers in primary schools, they tend to neglect girls. But if, you, if we take science books, science books for kids, the pictures of scientists are typically all about men. There is no you know, picture or you know, design of a female scientist. And therefore, you know, even young girls, they automatically make the connection. A scientist is a male scientist, is not a female scientist. And these are things that are relatively quick and easy to address. And we should really, really do it because it's very important. That's so true. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And as an aside, you know, I actually once wrote to a book publisher because it was a series of cartoon series for children and the pilots were all men and the flight attendants were all women. And, you know, we can't have that in, in today's day and age. But and, and, and you make a good point about scientists. I mean, Kanye Soren works with young, brilliant minds and, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because we're realizing that not only is she dealing with women who are not confident enough to commercialize their research, but there's not enough women even getting to that point uh, because, because STEM is so sort of set up, you know, designed uh, to, to exclude women from, from, from a young age. I wanted to quickly uh, come to Natalie with a, with a follow-up question. And in the meanwhile, remind the audience that uh, we have less than 15 minutes left. So if you have any questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat channel and we'd be happy to pick them up. Um, so we've talked so much about, about bias and um, Natalie, we'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, you know, perhaps new models of innovative finance or, you know, whether they're workarounds or whether they're just sort of, you know, uh, more ways to, to address the gaps faced by female founders, uh, women entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, and just to build on what Naoko and Julia and Tanya Son have said as well, um, Naoko, you mentioned the importance of uh, investing in the care economy. Um, so in that regard, looking at uh, innovative models, um, UN Women uh, has recently launched the uh, Care Economy Accelerator uh, to support uh, startups and companies which are uh, investing in the care economy and also operating in different ways, uh, whether it's looking at child care or uh, elderly care. So that, that's definitely a very important part uh, while we uh, wait for policy change uh, and uh, legal change at the same time. And also um, building on what Julia, you were saying about uh, unconscious biases and the importance of having a diverse room of decision makers and how that affects the final action access to finance of uh, women-led enterprises. Um, I think this is really interesting because we have to address this issue in two ways, right? One is, um, as you were mentioning, uh, shaping education um, and uh, changing norms of how uh, these different stereotypes may be uh, may be perceived. And um, concurrently, uh, we also address this issue through making sure that there are more diverse investors, uh, more diverse boards and investment committees. So one uh, innovative model of finance that our members and partners have uh, come up with, uh, one example is in the Philippines. So um, this is actually a partnership between investing in women, which is an initiative of the Australian government, as well as the Manila Angel Investors Network or MAIN, in the Philippines. So they have set up a sidecar fund to increase more investments into women-led businesses in the Philippines, as well as to increase the number of female angel investors in their network. So when an angel deal is made through Maine to a women-led business, this sidecar fund will match the funding to increase the total capital. So there you increase the access to funding for the business, and they also provide training for female angel investors uh, to become uh, more uh, mature uh, investors. Um, and uh, secondly, another important thing to do is to meet entrepreneurs where they are. So uh, Naoko, you touched on this as well. Um, it's difficult, uh, whether it's due to norms or uh, policies uh, in a lot of markets, especially in Asia, it's very difficult for women entrepreneurs to have formal financing, whether it's through banks or uh, other institutions. So um, very often they have to turn to venture capital. But uh, sometimes because venture capital, you have to give up uh, 
quite a high percentage of your company. Um, and this may not work well for a lot of women entrepreneurs, whether it's a different risk appetite or um, because very often their business is their livelihood, they have to take care of their family. So they would prefer to uh, own more stakes of the company. So uh, for example, one AVPN member in Vietnam uh, called Beacon Fund, uh, in their experience with the women entrepreneurs they've worked with, uh, venture capital was not a good uh, funding model. So instead they offered debt capital. Um, and another example is in the Philippines, um, Vilgro, which is a gender smart incubator. Um, they address the missing middle of the um, kind of the seed stage to right before growth stage of women-led businesses. So here uh, they offer an incubation program and they also offer a catalytic grant capital through the incubator at the end, as well as uh, they have a group of gender lens angels um, so that when they invest together, it offers a de-risking mechanism and also facilitates more funding to the women-led businesses as well. So these are just some uh, innovative models that we've been really excited to see through our members, partners, and other stakeholders in Asia. Thank you for that, Natalie. Wow, those are some really creative options and it's so heartening to, to just see that people are sort of thinking about uh, other ways in which they can, you know, they can reach uh, women entrepreneurs. I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's really pretty awesome. Um, so I actually am thinking that this was a really good roundup of, uh, of, of thoughts and commentary um, and, and provided a lot of insight into what the problems are, where we're coming from, and also where we, you know, where we're headed and all the things that can be. Um, were there, you know, are there sort of any comments left on the table that anyone would like to make before we close out? There seems to be uh, good comments in the chat section, but no questions yet. Very, very quickly, because I'm completely aware of the fact that we're running out of time, but I think the point Natalie made is really important uh, and is very coherent with what uh, we observed by talking to many uh, founders and organizations working with many entrepreneurs. That is basically, each time we discuss with a successful program manager, uh, you know, of these programs supporting women entrepreneurs in ASEAN, but I'm really sure that this applies uh, to every other uh, region in the world, they say, the, the key of, us, of our success was the fact that we want to listen to the women entrepreneurs in the different locations of our country, of our ecosystems. And I think this is very much what Natalie just mentioned. So the needs of women entrepreneurs across ASEAN could be very different, whether they're based in Jakarta or Singapore or in rural Cambodia. And all the uh, interesting and successful program uh, uh, we came across with they spend a lot of time to listen to women across different areas to really understand their needs and to design programs that were really meeting the different needs because we cannot talk about uh, women entrepreneurs as if conditions uh, or characteristics were the same everywhere. So taking into account this diversity is absolutely crucial. Thank you for that, Julia and Al. Looks like we might have a question or two. Let's see here. One from Bina Pandey. Uh, her question is, if we empower women through women-led enterprises, uh, what do you think uh, that we can increase the female labor force participation rate and thereby improve their standard of living and will that be effective in improving social indicators? Does anybody want to quickly take that because we are a little tight on time here? Mm -hmm. um, I will repeat the question. Um, if we empower women through women-led enterprises, I think what they're asking is, um, if we if we increased female labor force participation, would that be effective in improving social indicators? I would think that the short answer is yes. Mm. Does anyone like to take a bite at that? And if not, perhaps we can. But, but very quickly, well, I, I think the short answer should be yes. I mean, then we need to keep in mind that uh, entrepreneurship is just one channel to increase uh, women participation, right? I mean, we shouldn't forget about the fact that uh, maybe women want to be employer 
in large companies with very good salaries. Uh, so, I mean, uh, women entrepreneurship is very important and needs to be promoted, but uh, we need to then look at the composition of the labor market, uh, you know, in more detailed way, because not every woman may want to become a startup or, or entrepreneur. So obviously it's very important to make sure that those women that want to have a career, uh, you know, in the corporate world, they, they, they should be allowed to do so. <clears throat> And hopefully the, the women-led enterprise bit trickles down where women leaders actually make the, you know, the, the, the gender-related policy changes within companies that uh, often actually are not made even when women are leading them. So, so yeah, that's, that's important too. Uh, we have one more from, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this name, Saun Kanva. Um, so they are saying, I can say that changing social norms may take time. Do you have any experience or best practices on this? And do you think that gender budgeting is important to promote women's entrepreneurship? May, Julie, then maybe I'll just, um, I'll respond to that, but very quickly on the previous question, I just wanted to, um, I, I may not have fully understood stood the question but um you know i just wanted to point out that um in southeast um asia region um we have a, a bigger um uh, uh rate on the women's participation in the labor market um compared to the oecd average which you know may not be um for all of you um all of the the public um the general public may be able to understand but um that's uh but then that doesn't mean that it is improving women's um well-being in terms of uh their economic well-being because most of the jobs that they um engage in are very low paid um and very much disadvantaged and that's also kind of um uh paving the way way for women to um to, uh, start up business but um but then you know because of that uh women in the region don't really um always sort of you know uh, aspire to grow because of the um because of the the reason why they um start up their business um so i think it's, it's also very important to see um don't just look at the, the 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 figures and numbers but just look at the sort of you know uh the the issues behind it and then just coming back to this issue of social norms i just wanted to say that yes um in the oecd we have many best practices and we actually do have the, um, uh, as I said earlier, we have the ways to measure social norms and also provide um, best practices. And, and actually we have this um, tools that measure uh, what we call toxic masculinities. And I'm also kind of going back to, um, I think one of the speakers mentioned this, um, uh, I think Julia, but um, uh, there is also an issue of, um, uh, what the, some of the Japanese um, researchers call as a masculine, masculine, masculinization of deprivation that um, we also need to tackle when, you know, we are trying to um, uh, promote gender equality. So that's also to come back to, um, you know, when we try to tackle social norms, we also need to see what may be the potential negative consequence may be, and we'll need to also address that. 100%. Uh, totally agree with that. And, and, and that is that is also such important work that uh, that again, you know, on, on any on any ordinary day when I wake up, I'm not thinking that there are people out there actually working on this. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing. Um, thank you to you all. I think the bottom line is that uh, progress is happening, but it's extremely slow. Um, and I think there's a lot of very insightful commentary today on on things that are being done and more that that can be done. You know, a, a mentor of mine many, many years ago um, said to me when I wanted to do, you know, sort of dare to start, um, she said, you know, the road to success is paved entirely with losses and mishaps and mistakes, uh, but it can still take you where you want to go as long as you don't lose sight of your ultimate destination. Sometimes it's a meandering road, you know. Now, I moved here from Silicon Valley, where failure is worn mostly by men uh, as a badge of honor. <laughs> so uh, we should, you know, we should all be courageous. But uh, I think also what we learned today is there is so much work happening in building an ecosystem that is thinking holistically and, uh, and fostering the, the right kind of support 
uh, to help build the pipeline and then um, allow women to succeed um, to there to start. So um, with that, we are closing the panel. Um, but I must not leave you without telling you a little bit uh, about the exciting new things happening at Nikkei Asia, where I'm special projects editor, uh, which are actually related to the discussion we had today. Um, so this Thursday, uh, Nikkei Asia will be launching a new storytelling platform uh, on which we will be showcasing uh, deeply reported multimedia journalism about important themes that really are reshaping the world today. Um, so starting this Thursday, you will see a fabulous series on the future of food in Asia. Uh, lots of interesting reporting and great videos and photos um, and a very important subject. Uh, and after this series, the next series that we're working on is actually women and wealth in Asia. We're talking trillions of dollars. Um, and we might even feature some of our panelists from today. One of the pieces in that series explores uh, the female founder's journey in Asia and compares it to that journey in America. Everything from you know, raising money to exiting and everything in between. Uh, and we found some very interesting uh, statistics that might turn the stereotypes on their head and offer a bit of a counter narrative to the general perception of, of women in Asia, especially in the West. So please check us out on Thursday uh, and beyond at asia.nikkei.com. Come back often, subscribe, and stay tuned. Thank you to you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chakra, for your excellent moderation. This brings us to the end of the event. I would like to thank all of the panelists and moderator for participating and making this such an interesting and inspiring webinar. And of course, thank you to all the participants. Your attendance and questions are greatly appreciated. We hope that this forum has been informative and useful for you. For any of you who have questions about any particular issues, please always feel free to contact area secretariat at, at contactus at area.org. With that, I bid you all farewell. This event is now closed. Thank you so much. <laughs>